Thanks for joining me for Blunt Business on CannabisRadio.com. My next guests represent the industry-leading cannabis software suite and point-of-sale platform for cannabis retailers and delivery services, recently launching a new e-commerce product that combines the best of their software with technology provided by their most recent acquisition. So I talk with the CEO right now of Blaze, Chris Violas, and I'm also talking with the new, the person that's part of that most recent acquisition, the founder of Timber, that's T-Y-M-B-E-R, and the new vice president of e-commerce, Scott Rorick, here on Blunt Business. Thanks for being on, gentlemen. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So Blaze Ecom is what we're talking about. That's the, it's a native e-commerce technology that indexes retailer product menus, improving retail sites, SEO, and driving more organic traffic. Blaze Ecom also is going to provide Enhanced store branding and advertising opportunities while offering retailers the ability to set up their own e-commerce mobile applications at no additional cost, allowing for marketing via push notifications that typically prompt higher conversion rates. So we were talking just before about, you know, the, Chris and Scott, you know, just the area where SEO is more is important and driving that organic traffic and using uh, different areas with mobile and just other marketing strategies to do that. So talk to me about this marketing stand, this, this standout platform and what you're doing with this. Yeah, I can build that one. It's a pretty good pitch, to be honest with you. <laughs> oh, we work in STO over on another network. <laughs> you already know that with my bosses talking to your bosses, you already know that uh, we were kind of familiar with SEO because my boss originally was one of the first generation one SEOs back in the day, back in 1996. Wow. Yeah, that's old school. You used to be able to put white font on a on a white page back there. Yeah, we <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate I appreciate the cue up there. Um uh, as you said, I was the, the, the co founder and CEO of Timber, which was recently acquired by Blaze. Uh we're now powering the Blaze Ecom suite. And uh just to kind of back up a little bit, I thought it might be cool to kind of tell the story of, of how this all went down. So Myself and my original co-founder, we were working in the legacy market as early as 2012. And back then we kind of realized that there was a marketplace and that was really the only way that you got your weed on the internet. And if you were participated in that marketplace, you paid for advertising and that's how the phone ran. And the marketplace would not share the customer information with you. And you had to build your entire business on that profile. And so, you know, you're not actually creating an asset that lasts. And if you're a delivery service, that's especially a big problem because that's your whole storefront, right? That's your whole business. And when it got time for that business to be acquired, we realized that we had built a website, novel idea, uh, with e-commerce. And we were the first movers on Yelp and we had different marketing channels, which we owned. And those all pointed to a website, which was also owned. And so there was an asset, right? There was something to be acquired. We could predict the traffic. We knew the conversion rate. We could look at marketing channels across, you know, different marketing channels and see that conversion rate and deduce an ROI and make smart decisions with our money. And so that became kind of the, the sort of guiding light for the original Timber product, which was, hey, you know, you need to build your own asset and you stand on your own two feet. You need to set yourself apart um, and that's really blossomed, you know, over the years. And so we were actually working with Chris, um, I think in 2018. Yeah. And so Blaze is our first uh, integration. And um, we've, like I said, kind of come a long way since then. So a recent acquisition, uh, but really a really long partnership we've had. So it feels real good to get that over the line. So I want to just take a what Chris has said about what you've done work uh, with Scott or what you do with Timber. He mentioned how that Timber differentiates itself, quote, by enabling retailers to create a unique shopping experience, showcasing their brand through a growing catalog of premium e-commerce themes and by empowering the retailer with automated SEO and control of their data. And then you said about Blaze is that they offer a best in-class e-commerce solution, allowing Canvas retailers to get everything under one roof, better pricing, better support, streamlined onboarding, and holistic CRM. Uh, well, so I got to ask then, what was the background that you brought into the space for both of you individually? Because obviously you worked in the internet marketing, you worked in digital marketing, you worked in the SEO, and you worked in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So what is it you feel like you brought that has been the best of all both worlds you're bringing into and integrating into the cannabis space? Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, me, me personally, ever since college, I've either been a SaaS founder or an AGC owner. And so I've kind of worked at the intersection of software, e-commerce and SEO and, you know, uh, web development and all of that stuff. So uh, that's really exactly what we do and bring that that lens. Uh, we're obviously a SaaS product, but we brought that lens from sort of productizing what we used to do as an agency. And I think that's really a big differentiator um, for for how we approach these problems, right? It's like, if, if you're an agency, you see what people want to do and what they're hiring you to do. And if you do that enough times in the same industry, you start to say, hey, I can make this a product, right? And make this more efficient and affordable, quite frankly. So um, mm-hmm. that's kind of the lens that I brought. Yeah, and I think just to, to jump on that to kind of help stitch this story together a little bit more, Brasco, is, uh, look, I'm a former operator. I used to be a dispensary owner back in the day, back in uh, Prop 215 in California. So I had firsthand experience realizing that, hey, like this is the problem when the website's disconnected from the point of sale, when we don't have delivery tech, when we don't have all these types of uh, functionality that we need to really operate the business. And so I really look at it from that lens, and that also gives me a lot of ownership. I look at each shop that we work with, each dispensary, as if it were my own, right? So that's where... And when I started to, to to really work with Scott in the early days, I was impressed with. He was trying to, again, build this asset, the unique like expression, a unique identity, you right, for this for the suspensory really treat it as a brand, treat it as an asset. And that I really liked that. That resonated with me as an owner. It wasn't some like cookie cutter, you know, site that my website looks and this has the same experience as everyone else's around me. No, I want to stand out. I want to be unique and express myself. So I love that about uh, what uh, Timber has brought to the table. It's been a huge focus. And then beyond being an operator, right, I've had the chance to do some really cool work with the likes of Samsung. I've worked with and worked at big corporations, big tech companies like Amazon Web Services. So I've had kind of a really interesting, interesting intersection, I would say, of both cannabis operations experience and the technology and a little bit of kind of that, that, not a little bit, a lot of how software can kind of bridge the gap there. So that's to kind of round out the, the background on, on both of us there. So now recently, as of last October, uh, Blaze and Leafly announced an expanded partnership to boost operational efficiency for cannabis retailers, enhancing the online shopping experience. So Chris, you said about this with the announcement, quote, more cannabis consumers are shopping online than ever before. And this functionality will help dispensaries capitalize on this growing trend. So it's been about six months. How's it going for you so far? Good. Yeah. I think, you know, when we look at Blaze and again, just going back to the core, you know, kind of core background, which is we used to be operators. We treat every store like our own. We, we are always looking for different ways to help, you know, increase efficiencies for these operators, get more orders in the door. Just Scott's point when we were doing intros is, you know, we're here to sell more cannabis. We're, that's where our job is here, uh, what we're here for. So for us with Leafly and other channels, like it's so important to automate and integrate those channels so that, you know, Consumers can shop wherever they want to shop, right? If they want to go to Leafly because they've got great educational content to learn about different chirpanoids and different products that support those. And hey, they happen to be available at my local dispensary. I'll place an order here. Well, that order should flow directly into Blaze to be fulfilled, right? And packaged and ready to go. So we've automated that whole experience. So that order flows in. Um, Leafly knows how much inventory we have. So people aren't ordering products that, you know, frankly, we don't have quantities for, the dispensary does. And we're making sure that all that customer information is going back into that customer profile, right? So let's say that uh, they've been in store before, but they decide to shop on Leafly uh, as a second time, right? We're going to combine those uh, customer profiles, make sure they get the benefit of the rewards points of shopping, in, you know, with this uh, dispensary for two times. So all those things um, really come together. And it's part of looking at, you know, when we talk about commerce, we talk about go to market strategies with our dispensaries, like, yes, have a beautiful website, have a beautiful e-commerce experience that is unique to you. That's where Blaze Ecom comes in, right? But beyond that, you need to be selling everywhere you can, right? And that's where Leafly and these other uh, secondary tertiary marketplaces come in. So huge impact on the business and we we're getting a lot of good feedback on it. Fantastic. I want to go ahead and continue our conversation, but one area I've never got a chance to talk about when it comes to point of sale, track and trace, where deliveries are involved in the mix. So uh, I'm going to ask you, coming after the break, about, Regulatory compliance for cannabis delivery providers. And uh, this is something where, you know, a number of states are getting into this, but, it, you know, the obstacles that come across when it comes to being only going to do delivery services and a number of those states, by the way, for Blaze, uh, you operate right now 
you're available for licensed cannabis operators in Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Missouri, Nevada, New Mexico, New York, Oklahoma, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. Some of those are delivery states. We're going to talk about that aspect right here. I'm joined right now with Chris Vellis, CEO, and Scott Rorick, Vice President of E-Commerce for Blaze here on Blunt Business. Be back after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back. I'm here with Chris Violas, Chris Fellows, and Scott Rorick of Blaze here on Blunt Business. Before the break, I mentioned about how there's a story that came out from Cannabis Industry Journal that wrote about the importance of regulatory compliance for cannabis delivery providers. There are currently six states they mentioned that allow cannabis delivery. Those are California, Colorado, Massachusetts, Michigan, Nevada, and Oregon. And others like New York are taking steps to allow delivery with careful regulation. And with more states legalizing every year, delivery laws and existing delivery states are evolving and adapting to licensing changes. I want to take a quick part here to ask you about this. So delivery services allow cannabis companies to reach customers in areas where dispensaries are not allowed. And we know with the pandemic, it really did amplify this kind of service more than ever, curbside and all this kind of other stuff. And delivery now, everybody's getting everything delivered. Like it's such a big change to that. But now while cannabis delivery is an incredible opportunity for customers, if their companies to reach new customers, but they would not otherwise be able to, following the law can be difficult in an environment with a patchwork of local laws and changing regulator or regulation. So what do you need to know about regulatory adherence to stay ahead of the curve? What can you tell me, both of you, about what you've encountered with doing delivery services for companies with your software and what you've learned so far? Yeah, no, uh, Scott, I guess I'll take the first crack on this and we'll circle back on the econ component because that's definitely um, where the intersection is for us. So yeah, delivery and compliance. Um, I've been, as I mentioned earlier, doing delivery and running delivery service since 2011. So I've been at this for over 10 years now and I've seen the evolution in, in an alta markets, frankly, um, from medical to recreational in California to Massachusetts and, and Colorado rolling out the courier models uh, to New York, you know, launching its first, uh, uh, having a, a delivery component to its first couple of licenses. Like it's, it's really interesting and frankly, I'm excited about it. Um, to your point, Talk about the consumer behavior. People are just used to having that, you know, we'll call it the Amazon one click, right? Bring something to me in two hours, which is an incredible feat for anything, but uh, let alone if we can do it for cannabis, um, you know, that would be very fascinating. So I would say um, we've seen in different markets, different regulations and different changes, right? I would just speak maybe first to California because they have had some regulations that were changed on January 1st this year that are going to affect in about a week on April 1st, um, coming up pretty quick. And so what California has done is they said, hey, you know, they're probably the most uh, delivery friendly markets, I would say, by far in the US. Um, they first launched with kind of, um, one, the ability to be a retailer and a delivery service, right? And, and have your own supply as opposed to kind of the courier model, which we'll get to later on. But these are retailers that can do delivery, whether they have a storefront and they want to expand delivery or they're just straight delivery operators. What we have seen is over the last, since really 2018, 2019, when, you know, the regs uh, went to uh, recreational use in California, just a huge uptick in delivery action, which is great, right? It works in certain areas that are highly popular, um, have a high population density. You know, we're talking Southern California, we're talking in the Bay Area, um, where you can actually get better unit economics. And so what we've seen is California actually get a little bit more friendly frankly, with the delivery providers. They're allowed to carry more uh, what we call free inventory. Um, people know this kind of under the the protocol of an ice cream truck model where they have you know, inventory on the vehicle that's not ordered yet, right? And then as the day progresses, orders come in, they actually pack from the vehicle and deliver so you know they can reduce the amount of mileage they're going back and forth from home base or wherever the inventory is at to the customer. Um, so we've seen California actually say, hey, you know what? We're going to double the amount of inventory allowed for a vehicle and that just happened and is taking effect as we speak. And then you look at markets like Massachusetts, which is uh, a mixture of the courier model and what I'll call, you know, a retailer, a delivery retailer, if you will, that can do their own supply. It's uh, very limited, right? It's very challenging to be successful in delivery in, um, in mass. Uh, with the courier model, it's really hard to make money because you're not making that gross, uh, that margin on just the traditional retail sale, right? You're really trying to make margin directly on a delivery fee, which 
is very difficult to do, as you can imagine, driving in the snow, you know, having a vehicle. And in Massachusetts, you know, what's really a blocker is the economics specifically around, you know, having two drivers in the vehicle at once. Like, why is that there? Those drivers also have to have body cams. So imagine being able to just take one of those drivers away, how much cost you'd be saving per delivery and those economics wouldn't improve. So all in all, I think there's a lot of movement that needs to be made, but each market is kind of progressing independently. So I'll kind of pause there to see if you have any questions before we do. Right. Well, I want to mention when it comes to California, which is where you're based, you know, I, there was very early on when that delivery buzz was really going on. I want to say like was 2019, 2018, 2020, it was already getting developed before. And the pandemic just amplified and just Absolutely. We just got an aggressive growth in this type of service. It was going to happen five years down the line, but the pandemic caused this to go forward now quicker than ever. And just for myself, you know, uh, I will go ahead and make preface and say, listen, I drive for Uber. I do Uber East deliveries on the weekends because I like something to do. I'm, I'm like, don't like be bored at home. I can't do it. But I, I want to make the point where there are different approaches to how some people will do this type of delivery service, where it's like an Uber Eats or a Amazon approach where there's companies that have been saying, oh, we're the Uber of cannabis. We're the, you know, the Amazon of cannabis, right. Or the idea that you just mentioned now, Chris, about how Amazon might do a fulfillment center versus a whole foods delivery. So taking from the dispensary itself or taking from a fulfillment center, a warehouse wholesale versus retail. Is there any difference in terms of, you know, of a preference, I guess, because that organization would be able to have where if products are going to be taken from one or the other, Say if it's being bought in bulk. I mean, even if it's like you know, like the model where if somebody's buying in bulk and, you know, you're doing like the almost like the Costco style. We want to go and buy a bulk of whatever products there are in terms of vape pens or cartridges or, you know, or, or flour itself. I can only imagine it's there's a lot there of keeping that inventory correct and also making sure it's being delivered correctly. Yeah, I think, look, uh, I'm a huge fan of delivery you know, operations, being able to control their inventory, right? Being a retailer, um, we don't, you know, I know you tend to describe uh, Uber Eats and this last mile, like in cannabis, um, very difficult to get that done. There's only certain markets that allow this kind of courier model, which is to your point, people that don't actually own the inventory, but are still a licensed entity, right? For courier. So um, it's it's different, but my, fan, it, my, my big question where I think the industry needs to go is allowing these retailers to hold inventory, right? That is traditionally where you're going to make your margin at, right? It's just, hey, I buy for 50 bucks, right? I sell at a hundred bucks. I make 50 bucks in between. Well, okay, that's great. But how do we reduce the friction for the consumer? Well, let's let it be delivered at this point. Okay. Maybe we charge a $3 fee if, if needed, right? But that's really where from an, uh, an economics perspective, it's going to be viable and where the industry is going to, going to thrive long-term. And frankly, you know, Stodd and I have invested got countless hours into delivery and really optimizing um, the consumer experience. So Scott, maybe you can talk a little bit about kind of some things we've done together. So I think it's, yeah. it's vaccine and it's helping a ton of delivery services today as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, kind of working backwards. I mean, the career model sounds great. Um, I think we're missing some things in cannabis. Um, I think you need, first of all, huge market share. So you need volume for that business model to work as a courier. Um, you also need bigger margins for the retailer to share with the courier. Uh, two things that, you know, are a little undeveloped or, or a little premature, I guess. Um, and then the third thing is the actual, um, the regulations, right? Having two people in the car, body cams, all these different things um, where those are kind of like three strikes. It's tough uh, from a business perspective to make that work today. Um, I, it obviously has legs, you know, based in other industries, but um, it, the current model is tough right now. Um, and then, you know, going back to the original delivery <clears throat> Delivery has always been king in California, and, and it has been because the startup costs are less. You can deliver into areas that don't have dispensaries, for example. Um, but you know, even here, the economics are tough on the actual um, on the actual business. Once you get rolling, right, it might be easier to start it, but it's harder to make money because of the regulations. So we talk a lot about ice cream trucks, but you can't have this big mobile dispensary that just cruises around with a song playing like a real ice cream truck, right? No in reality. Yeah, the amount of, of space you have to ground, you have to cover. California, yeah, yeah. Ominous space. I never understand when I've talked to, very, it, it can be easy, it can be different deliveries. I don't even know how they do the ground that they cover. I know this in this particular market, and so they go out to a certain level area, but 
that's a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot of safety, the measures you have to put into place to make sure that nobody's able to go and take that product off of you. That's where the body cams and other safety measures are put in place, but that's a lot of work. I mean, I don't even know how sometimes where Amazon trucks are able to go out and do what they do because they're made, obviously we already know how difficult that is for them to be able to get their right. trucks out there. No matter how nice those Mercedes Benz vans are out there, there you got a whole lot of product to send and it can't be like an ice cream truck where they can just go around as they need to. They got to be able to get whatever shipments done, get them assigned and get them out and come back. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, you know, um, we're all excited for the regulations to change, but, you know, $3,000 of unsold product, you know, people, again, they imagine this FedEx truck or ice cream truck. I mean, you could put that in a cooler and a smart car, right? So the game for us, you know, we control what we can, right? And so as, as your software provider, we'd like to drive efficiency to help that business model. So, you know, some things that, that Chris and I have been working on for a long time with the integration between Timber and, and Blaze, and we'll obviously double down on that with Blaze e-commerce um, is like the ability to, for example, draw on uh, a Polygon KML files, uh, Polygon delivery zones, let's call it, uh, or dice up your or your dice up your uh, delivery um, uh, service area by zip codes, and then have different delivery fees or different um, order minimums per zip code and things like that, so that we can help people say, hey, maybe we can take deliveries way out here, but that's going to be a hundred and fifty dollar order minimum. Uh, as opposed to this one's just down the street, maybe that's just a fifty dollars order minimum, right? Um, things like that, and it's just a small example, but you know, helping again control what we can, right? And so there's a lot we can do on the software side to help drive efficiency because that really is the problem, right? Uh, Seven dollars and <laughs> worth of gas in, in California doesn't help either, but no. again, controlling what we can, right? Well, doing the Uber driving, I am pretty good at being able to find the the right where it deals when it comes to the rewards points and. Finding the right gas, well, you know, don't feel too bad. I, I don't want to make everybody too jealous, but I think I paid $3.22 for gas just this last week. So <laughs> I know. So it's sorry. <laughs> I want to just talk more about the delivery. This is great. I, and just to know, I mean, I love that we have all this expertise for that. You already understand this from the courier delivery aspect. Also, even talking about when it comes to temperature control. I mean, we listen, we already know about how there's already companies that are doing the, the long, trucking of like refrigerated truck but like there is there are companies like kroger right now that are expanding into doing fulfillment they're trying to become that new area where they're doing refrigeration grocery services just so it's just straight delivery and people are obviously getting much more normalized to the fact they can do this kind of thing so that demand is not going to slow down and we have to look at some other things when it comes to licensing and it comes to the permits because the other thing is we'll talk about this after the break that some their jurisdictions within states, certain cities might have different jurisdiction ju jurisdictions. So to be able to go and make sure to kind of geo target what areas you're allowed to go and deliver to, even though it's within your in the vicinity of that fulfillment center or that dispensary or that warehouse, there's a lot of red tape to go in between. We're gonna talk more about that with Chris Vellis and Scott Rorick, uh, CEO and vice president of e commerce respectively for Blaze. And if you want to check out the website, well, we go to commercial break so you can see what the platform looks like itself, blaze.me, B-L-A-Z-E dot me. And if you want to go and look at the new platform, it's blaze.me slash ecom. You can take a look at that. SEO-friendly e-commerce for cannabis retailers. Take a look at that while we go to break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Welcome back. I'm here with final questions for... Chris Vellis is Scott Rourke of Blaze, and we've had a great conversation learning about the platform, the new platform that has been put out there. And the other thing, too, is this this end of the conversation where we've been talking about delivery and for courier services, because it's one part that, you know, it, it's amazing how many times I've talked to point of sale, track and trace companies. And these are these other areas that I always look at, and I say, man, I dropped a story here from Cannabis Industry Journal, and it's like, what a good, this is a subject we don't get to cover too much, but Delivery is becoming much more common. Now, when it comes to delivery, we've already talked about the fact that there are eight states right now that already have delivery services, or six states, excuse me. But they also talk about this aspect of delivery that we have to consider, according to this story from Cannabis Industry Journal, is, to, is licensing specifically for delivery. Like regulations, licensing varies state to state and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So in Massachusetts, for example, there are two types of licenses. Licensed providers must either register as a marijuana courier or a marijuana delivery operator. 
Couriers are allowed to earn a fee for delivering cannabis products from licensed retailers to consumers. Operators may buy and sell cannabis products wholesale as well as deliver them. Colorado, delivery requires two permits, except one, a holder of both permits can still get in trouble if they deliver to an area or jurisdiction that is not affirmatively permitted delivery. And I know there's even some cities within states that don't not allow cannabis sales or, you know, they still have their own within laws, within cities or towns where they can kind of keep delivery coming in or they can stop, you know, anybody from still using cannabis, I guess. What can you tell me about this dual licensing issue and the areas of where you can and cannot deliver? Yeah, I think I'll take this. So, yeah, I think when it comes to the dual licensing, definitely it's, you know, you look at the unit economics, again, you start to look at a per, like what's the day in the light of a carrier? And you start to expand on that and you start to look at the regulations, which they have to abide by it. And you say, well, how do I make that work at the end of the day? Right. When you're trying to say, I made this, I delivered 10 deliveries today because it was snowing and it was really, there was a lot of traffic. So I couldn't get around as fast. So I only got 10 deliveries. Well, I have $5 delivery fee. So 50 bucks per day. Right. And that's a really low bar, obviously, but it's just an example to show you that, Hey, like the reality is it's, it's difficult. These people are not making enough ready to cover the demand that the regulations put on them, right? From a, a compliance perspective. So I think it's really difficult up there just to survive as a, uh, as a career model um, unless things change, right? And so that's my current status or current uh, thoughts on that. I think the wholesale model, I think is Brasco, you, you kind of coined there, is uh, where like what I would call a traditional retailer that buys in bulk and, and sells back to the consumer. That makes a lot of sense. Right, uh, it creates a lot of opportunity for things like vertical integration. Right, so imagine if you could grow your own product and then sell that and deliver that. Right, there's a lot of new opportunities that come out of it that I think are more sustainable and, frankly, better for the consumer at the end of the day. Um, so those are just some thoughts on uh, kind of the carrier versus uh, versus the retail model, wholesale model. I think um, the reason I kind of brought that up was because I have to renew my Costco membership. I got to go to that for the show. <laughs> but neither which way. Uh, but this area of when we're talking about with delivery, um, what about the aspect that there might be certain cities? Like, I, I know there's certain cities within California that, you know, they can't have the dispensaries or retailers in. So is there anything in terms of where certain jurisdictions might not allow cannabis to be sold or, or, or dispensed there? Is there any kind of issues when it comes to delivery to those markets that are underserved or, or cannot be served? Because they don't have, you know, they, there's no freestanding stores next to them. They get it delivered in. Or are they going to run into the roadblocks? You know, I think what we've seen is, yeah, to Scott's point earlier, right? There are some markets that just won't let a, a, a traditional retailer or traditional dispensary, right, open the doors up there. And so how do those markets get served? Well, cannabis can be a viable option for that. I think at the end of the day, when we talk about this kind of like, localized uh, municipality versus, you know, the state kind of who controls what, who determines what. I think it's good that the local, you know, municipalities do have a say in what the community wants. I'm a big fan of what cannabis has done to localize decision-making, localize the supply chain for that state. Um, I think it's great. I think it creates a really sustainable and strong foundation for the community. And so, you know, if they choose, hey, you know, I don't want a freestanding retail facility, I think that's something we've got to live with. Right, we got to find other ways to get to them. Um, delivery can certainly be that 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 uh, that vehicle. So um, I've seen it happen a couple times here in California. I've seen it happen in Mass. I've seen it happen in other markets. But there's always that one municipality that says, "Hey, you know, not going to open up doors here, or not going to allow delivery." And I think you got to understand that. You got to deal with it. You got to entice people that have to come to you or find them in the market to service. So just the reality of it. And you know, I want to give respect to the local communities for sure. Because, I mean, that's the other thing to do is with, with deliveries. It's not going to be available in all markets, even though you might see it in California. Because at, at the latest I can look out is, you know, that there are what uh, some about out of 500 municipalities in California, I think 85 are able to go ahead and allow retail cannabis sales. So, like, there's a lot of entanglement, I guess. And that's where I wanted to ask because about how much of an issue that is for a platform like Blaze Ecom to come into play and try to keep everything organized and set so inventory is set right. You know who's getting it sent out to. You know who is receiving the product to get sent out for deliveries or just to have it where people are going to get their hands on it. And all the new areas of delivery, whether it's curbside, 
in person, whatever it might be, so that the product is getting off the shelves, you know what it is, and through all the different entanglements you have to go through to make sure if it's delivery, if it's, you know, in person, however it's being sold, that you can keep a track on it. Yeah, I can I can take that one. Um, I think it's, it, you know, all this stuff is in flux, right? It's always changing. The regulations are changing. The economics are changing. And so keeping the platform flexible to be able to handle uh, everything from scheduled pickup to express pickup to kiosk orders, uh, and then on the delivery side, it just ASAP, right? Which is just, you order it, and we'll let you know when we can get there, the original style, uh, versus the pizza and the ice cream. So the scheduled delivery versus the ice cream delivery or the express delivery where the inventory is already in the car and servicing your area. And so as a consumer, you know, that's pretty cool because sometimes I might just need a pre-roll and I need it as fast as possible, right? I don't need the world's largest menu. I don't need a dispensary experience. I would just like to get a pre-roll delivered as quick as possible. That's why you, that's your express menu. And so, but sometimes I, maybe I walk, you know, a very specific, uh, you know, blueberry one-to-one Kiva chocolate crunch, and I'm willing to look uh, at a scheduled delivery for later today or maybe tomorrow because I want to shop 1,000 SKUs from your actual dispensary or from a larger, you know, safe inventory as a delivery. Uh, and so from a consumer perspective, we do offer that choice where the, the delivery or the dispensary can set it up that, hey, look, you can order from these 100 products that can be delivered to you quickly because they're already in your area, yeah. or you can order from these 1,000 products, schedule it for later because that way we can do, uh, you know, a more efficient route. Um, with those scheduled orders. And, yeah. and we can also have unsold products in the trunk as we do that route so that we're servicing that ice cream model at the same time. So it's just one example of sort of how we really think about, again, driving efficiency because that's going to have to be the name of the game because the regulations make it inefficient. So we have to work, we have to work really hard to bring that efficiency back so that the business model makes some sense. Yeah, yeah. And for those out there, this is just a little side tangent, but you know, if you're going to get an order from Uber Eats or things like that, you know, you go get the food. It's like, you can always go over the good, the, the, the standby, the Chinese food, the pizza. Yeah, you're going to be fine. But I wouldn't recommend like a Red Lobster and Olive Garden, like a little of those fancy, dancy places. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, awesome. they don't I'm just saying, because they do not specialize in takeout. Don't buy yeah. that. That food's going to be mid. It's going to be. You know, lukewarm when you get it, it's not going to be the same quality. So sometimes delivery is good. Like with cannabis, you can buy all the, these products. It's going to come in fine. It's a very justifiable reason why you want to have the convenience of getting it delivered. But some of this other stuff, no, I would recommend. That's just my point. <laughs> That's a good Chris. point. Thank you. I appreciate that. Chris and Scott, I really appreciate it again. I've uh, been joined here with Chris Viola, CEO, and Scott Rorick, who's been the founder of Timber and the new vice president of e-commerce for Blaze. One more time, let's go ahead and let people know about Blaze Ecom, a new platform as it's a, offering the species an opportunity to build a recognizable cannabis brand with integrated e-commerce on scale with your business. Blaze.me slash ecom. Uh, real quickly, take a minute to go let people know the about this and uh, where can they find you next if you're going on the road to show the platform to others and how people can, can, can stay in touch with you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that. So really excited. Um, go ahead and obviously, you know, follow us on Instagram. I'm at Blaze, uh, Blaze.HQ, or you can go ahead and uh, track us obviously on LinkedIn as well as our website, Blaze.me. That's going to have all of our our blogs are fantastic. We do a lot of webinars as well. So a lot of that content is there. And specifically when it comes to delivery and just learning more about e Scott just crushed a e uh webinar recently. So that'll be up on the site. But feel free to reach out to us. Um, all the contact information is on our site. We would love to work with you. And I think we're creating something special here, especially if you care about your digital property, especially if you care about efficiencies and that uh, the, the integrations that really drive the business for it. So um, that's what I got. But Scott, anything else to, to, to leave with? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention we had that delivery uh, ledger webinar coming up. So a uh, hot topic on delivery. So um, that's, that's coming out and you can find details on our website about that. Fantastic. And uh, you'll be out there on a lot of shows. I know uh, you've been doing things where you were at NECAN, you were at Interchange. You've been making on the road. So obviously people can, we'll see you on the road as well. And one more time, the website is blaze.me. Gentlemen, thanks for being on with us. Thanks for taking time out. Appreciate it. And thanks, you. Thanks for having us. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you, listeners. We'll talk to you next time.
the opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.